So let's do an example, okay? So we've got distressed seller here offering you a treasury bond where the contract says in one year, it's gonna pay the holder of the bond $110 and distressed seller is asking you for $100 for this contract. So let's say our investment mission is per the above, the above example. So we're a short-term investor looking for strong guaranteed investments here. So that would lead us to an opportunity cost investment of buying portfolio of CDs from as seen on bankrate.com. You can, I think you can even buy them from bankrate.com. I'm not sure, I'd have to double check that. Or our opportunity cost investment could be simply buy shares of the Mint ETF. And we've done our work as we did in the last chapter. We found that the corresponding opportunity cost of capital for either of those is 5%. And we wanna know, should we buy, should we buy the bond? Should we buy the bond? Well, let's see if we can figure this out using our steps for the NPV method, okay? We want to apply the NPV equation here, and we're gonna to need to know our opportunity cost of capital and all our cash flows. Well, the opportunity cost of capital, we just figured that out, right? That again is the average of many CDs or the published uh, interest rate of the min ETF. We do know the cash flows. The contract says we get 110 in a year. We could buy the bond for 100 right now. So those are all the cash flows. Now this one here is a little tricky, okay? Remember, all these cash flows need to be project risk adjusted. So the cash flow at t equals zero, that's adjusted because that's what we have to pay to buy this contract. So there's nothing we can do with that, the cash flow at t equals zero, that's adjusted. But the cash flow in the future needs to be risk adjusted. This is the contractual promised cash flow. But in this case, it's also the project risk adjusted cash flow. Why? Because if we have a stupid manager problem at the bank and the bank flames out, it doesn't matter. The FDIC is going to come in and pay us if the bank defaults. And remember, the FDIC is under the U.S. Treasury and there's very little risk to that. So in this case, the promised cash flow is equal to our risk adjusted cash flow. So we don't have to worry about that. So we can jump right into the NPV. So applying the formula up here, um, I've got what's my first cash flow? Minus 100. And if we wanted to be real pedantic about this, we could say one plus 5% raised to the zero. And as we know, anything raised to the zero is equal to one. So we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, so then we'd say minus 100 um, plus 110 over one plus 5% um, raised to the what? This comes in one year. So we use our year time units and say one, and that's looking pretty good here. And I can do a little bit of arithmetic on this one. That's minus 100 plus, if you work out this, I think what you will find here is 104.76. You should check me on that, of course. Okay, and so the NPV, if we work that out, is equal to 4.76. That's what we got here. Our NPV is equal to 4.76. So what, is that, what does that mean here? Well, a good way to think about this is something like this, okay? Um, our NPV is equal to 104.76 minus 100. So if we write it in this way, we can say that our NPV is equal to the present value of the flows that we buy. We're buying in present value in normalized terms, in T equals zero terms, we're buying this 104.76 cash flow. And that is, we've got to say now, minus the price paid for these cash flows. Okay, so what do we have here? We have just rearranging a little bit what I've got up here. 
I've got my NPV equals 104.76 minus 100, or in words, that's the present value of the flows that we purchased, only one in this case, minus the price that we had to pay for these cash flows, which was 100. So in this case, NPV is greater than zero, so we want to buy the bond, okay? And we're buying the bond because the NPV is greater than zero. Okay, good. So there are a couple of important and interesting interpretations of this NPV of $4.76. The first one is called the increased wealth concept. And the increased wealth concept says that positive NPV projects increase the investor's wealth by the amount of the NPV. So what do we mean specifically in this example? By making this investment, we've just made our firm richer by $4.76, the amount of the project's NPV. We have to remember that richer is going to be a relative term. It's going to be measured against making opportunity cost investments, not against doing nothing. So what we mean by making ourselves $4.70 richer is $4.70 richer than we would be if we just threw $100 into our opportunity cost investment. Okay, so again, when we say richer here, we mean that this is relative measure, not an absolute measure. And another way to think about it, again, is if we didn't make the investment in this project, what would we have done? We would have put our $100 into shares of Mint or our portfolio of CDs, which we know would have earned us an average of 5%. And both of these are projects with zero NPVs, okay? So the logic of this is kind of important. We're, we're assuming here, once we have an investment mission, whenever we get money to put into that mission, we're going to invest it. So we're going to look around for a positive NPV project, and if we find one, we'll invest the money in that. But if we don't, if, for example, you are this project manager, and your friend gives you $100 to invest, if you look around and you can't find any good investments like the distressed seller investment, you're not just going to let her money sit there and not earn anything. You're going to put it into the opportunity cost of it, uh, investment. You're going to put that $100 into shares of the Mint ETF, so at least the person who's given you the money is going to earn her 5% on that. Okay, so the second important thing we can say about this is called the equivalence concept. And the equivalence concept says that investing in this project is completely equivalent to receiving $4.76 today. How does this work? Well, let's consider that we have two choices today. So the first is we could invest $100 in the distressed seller project. And the second one is we could have someone just drop on our head, just out of the sky, just drop $4.76 on our head. And then we could invest the whole $104.76 at our opportunity cost of capital for a year, which is the life of our project. What the equivalence concept is saying, we have no preference between these options. Okay, so getting $4.76 dropped on our head and investing it in our opportunity cost investment is exactly the same as putting $100, not getting the $4.76 dropped on our head, and putting our $100 into the distressed seller project. And we have no preference between these two. So you can prove this to yourself by, on the one hand, find the future value of 104.76 invested at 5%, that's our opportunity cost of capital, for one year. You're going to find that that's equal to 110 and compare that to the future value of 100 invested in the distressed seller project. So here's, here's how this would look mathematically. So if we get the 476 dropped on our head, we add that to the 100, invest that in the shares of the Mint ETF, we know we're going to get 5% on that, and you should work this out, but you should convince yourself that that comes out to 110. On the other hand, we don't get $4.76 dropped on our head. We invest 100 
into the distressed seller project, and we also, as we've shown, wind up with 110, which is the contract amount for that project. Okay, this project is the distressed seller project, right? All right, so that's it for the NPV method. It's a very simple, very straightforward method. Um, we just need to know for this method what all our cash flows are, when they occur, and we need to know our opportunity cost of capital. Then we just do the arithmetic and make it work. Okay, so our second method is our benefit cost ratio method. This is very similar to the NPV method, but now we're going to make a ratio out of some of the numbers. So the benefit cost ratio method is universally abbreviated as BCR, and we need to know what a BCR is. BCR stands for benefit cost ratio, as I said, and it's defined to be the present value of a project's cash inflows. So these are going to be positive, right? These are our positive flows divided by the present value of the cash outflows, and the outflows are negative algebraically. Okay, and of course we discount everything at the opportunity cost of capital. So now we're back to ratio analysis a little bit, and let's see if we can think about this. This is kind of a bang for our buck ratio. We've got in the denominator usually what we have to put into a project to enjoy what's in the numerator. So we want this ratio. This is a clear case where bigger is better. And in our ratio analysis chapter terms, there is going to be a knife edge here. So we'll think about that. All right, so bigger is better. And I think the knife edge is easy to see here. If the present value of the cash inflows is equal to the outflows, then we're sort of right on the border, right? So what we really want is we want the numerator to be bigger than the denominator, right? That's what we're really looking for. So this one would be what we would have called a knife edge in our ratio analysis work, okay? Another thing you should know about the BCR ratio method is that some textbooks call it a profitability index. It means exactly the same thing. They'll just call it profitability index. Depends on the textbook. Some articles will call it a BCR. Some articles will call it profitability index. It means exactly the same thing. All right, so there is a drawback of this method. The drawback is that the benefit cost ratio does not say how much wealthier the project makes us. So it's giving us less information than the NPV method. So the quants among you all would say something like this. It as a method is less robust than the NPV method. Okay, so this is, this is a drawback. It's always good to know how much wealthier we're going to be by taking a certain course of action here. So now let's do our distressed seller example for the BCR method here. So we're still going to want to work with our NPV equation because that's the equation that gives us the present value of all our future cash flows and the cash flow that we have for this project at t equal zero, okay? So let's plug in and get our ratio. So I want in the numerator the present value of all the positive cash flows for this project. So I think there's only one, and that's the one that's gonna happen in a year's time, okay? So that's going to be 110 divided by, I've got to present value it, okay? So I've got to divide it by one plus five percent raised to the one. So that's my numerator. And in the denominator, I want the present value of all my negative cash flows. I only have one, and it happens at t equals zero. So I don't have to worry about discounting it, because it's already sitting at t equals zero. And we have something like that. Okay. And if you work that out, you should check me on this should check me on all of these. Okay, I've got Excel right over here, but I'm counting on you, as you can see, more and more to check these numbers yourself. So I'm showing you the numbers, and I'm counting on you, computing them on your calculator to make sure I got it right. So since the BCR is greater than 1, since it's greater than 1, that means it's telling us to buy the bond. 
And you want to note that this is the same recommendation as we got in the NPV method. And that's always going to be true unless you've made a mistake. If you get a positive NPV for a project, that means you should go for it. Well, that's what the model tells us. The model says you should go for it. And the if you do a BCR calculation on the same project, you should get the same recommendation. Okay, they're always going to work in the same direction. This is always the case. They're always going to recommend the same thing. They get there a different way, but they're always going to make the same conclusion.